very heartily welcome to Gothenburg, Thank Marie. You. Darius Sek. <laughs> Très bien. <laughs> it, it, uh, it's not that easy. No. Uh, um, does it mean anything? I, yes. It's very beautiful, but does it, what does it mean? It, it means um, who lives near the dry river. Ah, who lives near the dry river, near uh, um, Biarritz or something? It's, it's more a name from the inside of the Basque country. I was born in Basque country on the coast, but my family is more in the remote lands on the river, I suppose, back in the times. So you have both the French culture and the Basque culture mm -hmm. and the English culture, I know, and uh, now you have taken on a very famous German artist, Paula Morrison Becker. Um, I, I make this as a journalist. I just remind us all that Paula Becker was born in 1876, right? Yes, I, I, I have to say right now that she's not famous. We tried to make her famous. And I tried very hard. <laughs> so she's becoming a little bit more famous. And thanks to the exhibition too in Stockholm. That's absolutely <laughs> true. Absolutely true. Especially in France, I would say. And let's come back to that. Uh, in, in, in what re respect she is forgotten or not. But anyhow, let's remind ourselves that she was born in Germany in 1876. She married to another painter, Otto Moderson, and she was a close friend of the famous poet Rainer Maria Rilke. And she became a part of the artist's colony in Worpswede, outside Bremen, in northern Germany. And she also painted a lot in Paris and took lessons. And she's said to be the first woman in art history to paint a naked self-portrait. And we will come back to that, of course. She worked extremely hard. She was very productive. In 1907, she gave birth to a daughter. She was 30, uh, 31 years old. And after 18 days in bed, she went up and died due to a blood prop. What's that in English? Emboli, I think. Ebol Lung emboli. Embo embolia. Perhaps. Embolia, yeah. right. Her last word was schade. Mm. What a pity. Sin. You might say that, right. So now, Marie, what was your first encounter with Paula? What so turned you um, on? It's, it's really a, a love story uh, with this woman who died a century ago. Um, it took me by surprise. Uh, in general, I write novels, fiction. I, I love fiction. Um, but I, I, I received... Um, an email and how do you call that those unwanted emails and an email and I a was spam a spam maybe? yes you say spam too yes and it was um, an email for a, a, a conference of psychoanalysis about mother and child another one and and there was a stamp size little picture of a painting that I never saw in my life, of a woman nursing a child lying on her side. And at that very time, I was nursing my third child. And I was nursing her on my side because it's so much more comfortable. Because nobody stands like a Madonna, like that, you know? You cannot nurse a breastfeed a child when you stand like that. It's so much better like that. So I, I, I asked myself, who painted that? When? Who? So, you know, Google, so I found her and I discovered that she was a woman um, who died at the very beginning of the 20th century in childbirth, after childbirth, but directly linked to childbirth. And her name was Paula Modersenbecker. I had never heard of her. And via internet, via Google, I, I... We are so lucky to have internet because 
when I was born, I would never have found pictures of her. And there was everything, so many paintings on the internet, you can have a look. And I thought, wow, this is fabulous, and I never heard of her. And a major work is in Bremen, so I went to Bremen, and I started not studying her, but really falling in love with her painting and with her life. And when I discovered, as you said, that she was friend with Rilke, that I had read so much and loved and hated, because I don't like him so much. I like him and I don't like him. This friendship with, between them is such a good story for the storyteller that I am, that I thought, okay, I'm going to write a novel about her. And then, no, not a novel, because she was not known at all. Nobody knew her except in Germany. So I had really to do the boring job of research, to tell exactly what I could tell about her, uh, uh, her real life, the truth, if I, if I could. Fortunately, I, I discovered she had wrote a diary and a lot of letters. I don't even speak German, I can read it a little bit, but the diary is translated by an American university, so it was easy to find. And so I started writing about, about her with her diary, which is also a problem, because in a diary you say things and you don't say things. So, well, it was a long story, but in the end I could write. How, how do you write the story of a... A life is not a story. A life is not made of, of words. It is made of words, but it is made of other people, of the words of other people, of dialogues, of babies, of feelings, of, of weather, of, of countries, of landscapes, and of art, in her case. So I, it was the first time I had to write a biography. And I really discovered it, it's, it's thin, because I wanted to respect what I didn't know. I put everything I could find, everything I knew, but what I, what I don't know, I didn't, I didn't say. So, and I hope I did well. Mm. That's absolutely one thing that I love with your book, that it's so elegant, you learn a lot. I mean, you really deal with Paula Morders on Becker. She existed, it's her life, it's her art, but you have chosen so cleverly because it's, uh, it's exciting. Sometimes you get a bit scared. <laughs> it's, uh, the language is beautiful, but it is very matter of fact. Mm. It's uh, fact, but in facts, but in a poetic way. And I think a lot of biography writers of today who insist on always writing 500 to 700 pages mm -hmm. have a lot to learn. Um, so, um, but I, I'll. Uh, and I'll, I, I'll spare this question for a little while. I have a question here. But, but I think, let's start. Let's start with Paula. Uh, I th I'll, I'd prefer to say Paula than Paula. What do you prefer? I think in Germany they say Paula. Yes, mm -hmm. in Swedish too. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> good. Uh, uh, what sort of a girl was she? Um, we, we get some glimpses of her and her close friend, Clara Westhoff, mm -hmm. who was going to become a sculpture, too. Uh, and we see two, two intelligent, vivid girls running around, enjoying themselves. And I get the picture of two embryonal new women. You know, the new women were actually... Um, creeping up from behind in those days, at the turn of the century. Uh, what, what, was, what sort of a family did she come from? What was her background? Mm -hmm. She came from um, a bourgeois family. Her mother was aristocratic, but not very rich, and her father was an engineer in uh, railways. And um, there is a very beautiful letter of Mathilde, her mother, for Paula Thirty's birthday telling her how she was born. And I think it's a very beautiful letter that a mother can write to a daughter for a birthday. And um, she says, your father was not there. He had always been there for the other, for your, your two brothers. But there was a big storm and the railways were falling apart and he had to go because of the flooding and he missed your birth. And her father loved her very much, 
this daughter. And, and, um, and the, the epic story of, of the birth of Paula is already the start of her life because the old, um, we, what's the name of it? There, the midwife, yes, the old midwife. Bohemushka. <laughs> <the laughs> yes, um, was very old, there was no doctor, etc. And she clumsily uh, had the, f the, the, the lamp, the petrol lamp, fall on the bed of the new mother and put the fire to the bed. And the new mother with the baby had to, to get out of the bed and put water <laughs> on the bed. And that was the start of her life. And, 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 and the letter is wonderful. And, uh, and in this family, there was a lot of love and, and a lot of fire. And she was an artist from the beginning. Her brother and sisters too, but she was the real one. And she wanted to study art, but we are in uh, northern Germany, uh, like in the Budenbrock, you know the novel by Thomas Mann. Uh, very, uh, not so much religious, but very um, austere um, Puritan people. And girls don't study art. Um, when they do, it's just like a little bit of piano. But she was very, very serious about it. The father was worried. He wanted her to be a, um, une gouvernante, a nanny. And there is another beautiful letter of the father, and she's around 20, and she says in her diary, Father wrote me today to be serious and become a nanny. I stayed in the heath under the sun, reading Knut Hamsun. And Pan, Pan, uh, I don't know the title in Swedish of Knut Hamsun. Uh, Pan. Okay. The, the, the god of the forest. Yeah. Mm. And so that, that's exactly what she... She doesn't care about earning a living. She wants to, to be in the sun and read and paint. And, uh, well, what saves her uh, will be a, a, a marriage with Otto. Otto Modersen was a famous painter, successful one, rich enough to, uh, to take care of her wife and pay her tools to, to paint. But nobody took her seriously. And... Um, Um, that's a long story, the, the, the wedding, the, the marriage with Otto. <laughs> I can tell it now if you want, but perhaps no, you have we'll, other questions. We'll, we'll, we'll keep that. <laughs> yes. as a, we'll, we'll, let's not spoil it yet. <laughs> because I, I would like to... Yes, because there is a lot, of, in a way, there is a lot of suspense in her life. That's what I liked too. Why did she marry him and not that other one? Why not Rilke? That's a, a question. Yes, yes. yes. And so the diary tells it all. <laughs> That was exactly what yeah. I was going to ask. But before we ask, why did she choose Otto and not Rilke? Mm. We must present Rainer Maria Rilke, who we usually know as a, a, a name on the back of the books up here in the library. But here we meet him as a charming young man and sometimes a monster of a husband. <laughs> so it's, uh, he's an ambivalent man. But we can, um, we, we can at least notice that the two friends, Paula and Clara, uh, They meet with, with all these guys of the Vorpsvede colony. And, they, and it, you, you suggest that Rilke, at the beginning, fell in love with both Clara and Paula. Mm -hmm. Clara, the tall brunette, and Paula, the, the little blonde. Uh, was that his style? Yes, he was always in a trio. Tr trio? Tri Trouble. Yeah. <laughs> Um, he, he was a, a triangle, can we say? When he was with uh, Luandra Salome, he was in love with other girls too. And Luandra Salome, that you know, you know, the Nietzsche Freud uh, uh, friend, uh, a, a woman who was about 10 years older than the young poet Rilke, uh, she told him, go, go live your life. Um, Uh, come back, perhaps, but go live your life. And he was a bit distressed, and he landed, in a way, in uh, Worpswede, this little colony, art colony in the north of Germany, where he had a friend, Henri Vogeler, quite a good painter. That is shown in Stockholm, too. And um, he, he was a bit lost, and all of a sudden, at a dinner, in this very small village, there are those two young girls, the brunette and the blonde, exactly his age. They were all... 23, at the beginning of their life, and it's um, 1900, it's really the beginning of the century, it's the beginning of everything in a way, and they are full of, uh, it's the summer, and they wear, we have some photos, 
and they wear those beautiful white dresses, you know, long with short leaves and hats. It's like a painting already. And he totally falls in love. And he, he doesn't know how to choose. But, of course, he chooses the one who will resist. And who resists him? Paula, my Paula. She is not so much interested in Rilke. She, she is interested in painting. And that's what, is, that's what, to me, is very seducing, seductive with her, very attractive. She wants to paint. She, she, she's got something else than, than flirting. But the letters are very ambiguous. She likes to be loved, of course. So she's very flirtatious, too. But she's... Anyway, to make a long story short, she rejects him quite nicely, and he marries Clara, the brunette, the best friend of Paula. And the marriage is a, is a disaster. Marrying Rilke is the worst idea any girl can have. It's, it's don't do that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and as soon as a baby is born, because of course in those times babies were born very, very soon, he flies away because, and he writes it very, very flatly. He says, I cannot write. The baby cries all the time and it, it's disturbing. I, I cannot concentrate on my writing. So he goes to Paris and he meets Rodin, the great sculptor, Rodin, the genius Rodin. And that's the beginning of another story. He will, who will have um, echoes with Paula because Paula will meet Rodin. It's the beginning of the Parisian story of Paula. Anyway, uh, forget Rilke as a father, forget Rilke as a husband, but Rilke can be a good friend and they will stay friend all their life. Um, it's a very beautiful uh, friendship story between a man and a woman. Ambiguous, of course, but uh, the letters are, I quote many letters, the letters are wonderful because this poet, this genius poet that we know has very, you know, high bro, high level, a bit in the, in this, dans les terres, in the sky, he, <laughs> he has the most material problems with her because she's, she can be very annoying, Paula. Uh, when she is in Paris, for example, she wants Rilke to buy furniture for her. And after she, after she gets the furniture, she wants to get rid of it very soon, uh, after six months. And so here, here is our great poet in his 30s who has to sell old, an old mattress, an old bed, an old chair. An old, he, he doesn't know where. He, he, so he asks the concierge. And you have all these funny letters of this great poet. And he does not succeed no, either. he does not <laughs> succeed. <laughs> He's a lousy salesman. <laughs> yes. And she, she is really very annoying because she's angry with him. And I, I, I had a lot of fun but, reading but, those letters. But, but, but we must um, admit this, that the tension in the book is very much between Paula and Rilke. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the ambivalence and it is because it's with him that she can talk about art. art. Mm. And um, also, uh, you may know his uh, famous uh, requiem, requiem, uh, requiem for a we friend. We can take that later. Okay. We take the famous that, that's, that's for her. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would ask you about this. In a letter to Rilke, Paula says that she does not approve of the aesthetics of death, mm. so popular among the symbolists of her time. Then, you know, there is Edvard Munch and uh, Böcklin's Island of Death. All the artists were occupied with death. But she says she does not approve of that aesthetics. And she says to Rilke, I want the permission to allow myself everything. Mm. And I think that was so interesting. And it reminded me of, and most of us, I think, of Edith Södergran, the famous, in, in Scandinavia, famous uh, expressionistic poet. And she said something like, uh, det tillkommer mig inte att göra mig mindre än jag är. Um, does not become myself to make me smaller than I am. Mm -hmm. And isn't that typically Paula? Paula? Yes. And it's typically woman also, because they had really, again, um, nobody took her seriously when she 
she only exhibited paintings twice in her short life. And the first time uh, she was with other ladies, and it was a lady show, and uh, a, a critic said that um, her paintings gave him nausea and that they were an, an insult to German uh, art and German women. And she will have a story with a Nazis too, who will call her entachtet, degenerate, after her death, of course. Um, but she, she, she was very daring and she tried a lot of things. She was influenced by Cézanne, Gauguin, Le Douanier Rousseau. Um, very soon, she understood Cézanne before anybody else, in a way, and especially in Germany. Uh, as soon as she went to Paris, there is a beautiful letter of, of Clara, her best friend, who says that Paula went to um, the, the, the merchant of, uh, of Cézanne, Vollard, the gallery of Cézanne, who was known but not so well known. Um, and Paula was there, and the Cézanne were on the ground, and she turned them and showed them to, to her best friend Clara and said, there is here a new simplicity. And she also said, Cézanne struck me like a big storm. He was the great event of my life. Cézanne, not Rilke, and not her husband. <laughs> and uh, she never met Cézanne. He was a bit too old. He, he died uh, soon after. Um, but she understood painting, modern painting. And she died exactly at the same time, the same year, when Picasso sees a, an, an African mask for the first time and understands that faces are masks and that you can turn them on the third dimensions, and that is cubism. And she is pre-cubist, as we that's, agree. That's very interesting. That's 1907. Because her famous portrait of Rilke mm -hmm. um, has this mask mm -hmm. structure. Mm -hmm. It, 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 it reminds us of Picasso's African masks. But you said she did that before. Just before. But she was, she, they were a lot uh, of, uh, they were all going in that direction, the good ones or the interesting ones. Uh, even Gauguin uh, at his, the end of his life, Cézanne, of course, they, they, they were going there and Picasso will have that explode. And she was there. She and was James there Ensor, as a young, maybe. As a young, isolated woman. That I don't understand. How did she understood that? And she, and she died too soon, alas. But at the end of her short life, you have everything. With which years did she go? When did she go to Paris the first time? In, in 1900, in a, for oh. the um, Universal Exhibition, you say? When they built, no, not when they built the Tower Eiffel, just after. But anyway, that she, she discovered Paris in, in a sort of huge party of this, comment uh, on uh, en anglais, universal exhibition? I don't know. Um, anyway. Wertschutzstellning. Uh, uh, L'exposition universelle. The, the world exhibition. The world exhibition, mm. c'est ça. And, and she, she, got, uh, she got a medal. She, she, <laughs> was, she, she, she was. She uh, was. Oh, I have to tell that. Sorry, I can't talk for hours about her. Uh, so please you have to go tell on. Me. <laughs> go on. <laughs> so you have to understand that Paris was the only city in the world where women could learn to paint on nude models. It was forbidden or even unthinkable in any other city. In Paris, young girls from everywhere, America, Russia, all Europe, could Australia even could come and study on nude models, with some restrictions. In the public system, in the Beaux-Arts, the models were dead. They were lent by the um, me medical Morgue. academy, just close to the Beaux-Arts. So you painted, the girls were allowed to paint naked, dead bodies, and he, it gave her terrible headaches. But she, she writes her parents that at last she understand how a knee is made. It was very important to paint on naked bodies, to understand the body. And girls were forbidden that. And in the private system, you could pay, as a girl, very expensive, twice the price than when you were And you can paint on um, alive models, human beings. The, um, the female models were, were entirely naked, and the male models wore a very silly underwear that you can see on her paintings. <laughs> well, all this is incredible, but, but true. I mean, it's, that was the state of the world, and in a way it still is. It's, uh, but really, at that time, being a woman painter was 
some sort of a epic adventure. Mm. It was very hard. And people laughed at her, etc. Mm. And she loves Paris. Mm -hmm. she, she definitely has, she has an eye for uh, sensual qualities mm -hmm. in fabrics, fruit, flowers, and the sounds and smells of the city. We must call her a true Paris romantic. And, and uh, when you um, quote her and, and uh, tell us about her life in Paris, I must ask you, do you, do you like her as a writer too? Do you like mm. her she's language? Not, she's not a very good writer. Sometimes she's too much under the influence of Metterling, for example. Exactly the people she critiques that are too much close to the death aesthetics. So sometimes her pages are very lyrical, very, very young girl in a way. But as soon as she speaks about either painting, not very often, or her love relations, she becomes very tough, very no-nonsense, because she really tries to understand what is happening to her. And those parts are very good. The parts of the diaries when she talks about her marriage, about her disappointment, uh, including in her sex life, it, it, they are very, yes, no-nonsense. So she's a better painter than she writes, but the diary is good too. Mm. And that is an, an eerie presentation of poor Otto. Um, Otto Morderson, he was an established painter, a good painter, specializing in landscape, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and he was, um, um, he sold his works mm -hmm. and, and he could take care of a family. And a very tragic thing, his former wife died giving birth to their daughter, Elsbeth. So he is a widow um, and um, when he marries uh, Paula. Did she only want, or, or she, was she just looking for a stable relationship? Mm -hmm. Or do you think she loved him in the first place? It's very ambiguous because uh, really at that time, either you had to be a nurse or a nanny or you, you married and she wanted to paint. So she was very materialistic in a way. Uh, but also when she met him, something happened. Uh, you can read it in the diary. He's, he's much older than she is, but he's handsome, he's clever, he can speak about art, he's a good painter. And also, she likes very much the little daughter, Elsbeth, and she will paint her beautifully. She is so serious about painting little girls. I think it's the, almost the best part of her work, because she takes them seriously. But I would like to read a, a little part. What, what I liked, too, in her diary and in her life and in her letters, is that she has the same questions that we have, men and women. Am I marrying the good person? Is it possible to stay my whole life with one person? How, how do the other people, other people do, etc. And also, um, as a woman in the beginning of the 20th century, she was supposed to be a woman, especially to cook. <laughs> she couldn't care less about cooking, but she had to take two months of lessons of cooking in Berlin before getting married. Her parents demanded that, and Otto also could not imagine a wife not cooking. So she spent two months, and the letters to Rilke during her cooking lessons are so funny. And because she's in Berlin, she cooks potatoes all the time. It's a, it's a, anyway, but I will read just the part about her first... Um, My experience tells me that marriage does not make one happier. It takes away the illusion that had sustained a deep feeling, a deep belief in the possibility of a kindred soul. And it is perhaps better without this illusion, better to be eye to eye with one great and lonely truth. I am writing this in my housekeeping book on Easter Sunday, 1902, sitting in my kitchen, cooking a roast of veal. And this is so incredibly feminine, the, the feminine experience of cooking a roast of veal for Easter, when you just want to paint, or walk, or, or dream, or think, or whatever. Well, I like to cook, 
And uh, you can dream while cooking, but you cannot paint while cooking, that's for sure. That, that part is very... When people know about her, they know this little part of the diary. It sounds so melancholy, in a way so feminist before time. She, she never used the word feminist. Uh, she was not exactly a feminist. But also when I search about her in Bremen, in the ar archives, there are a lot of things, um, I discovered that, in fact, she didn't cook. She cooked on that very day because it was Easter and because the maid was on holiday for one day. The maid was there every day from 7 in the morning to 7 at night, taking care of everything. And so she was a bourgeois wife. But the memory that people like to keep of her is a romantic memory of a young woman sacrificed to, you know, marriage, children, cooking, etc. But no, in fact, when you read her diary, she had a whole day to paint. The problem was she had to ask money to her husband, she had to ask everything to her husband, she was not free. Exactly like what Virginia Woolf says, you know, Virginia Woolf, uh, a woman needs a room of one's own and 500 pounds to, to make a living to, to write. And she had the same problem, she was not independent. And she flees uh, four times to Paris, she tries... And Otto is very generous, so he's, he sends he's, money, he's very she, let her go, she lets her go, Absolutely. and asks very politely if she can come back. Yes, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Yes, his letter. Uh, but you know, he's a good man. The yeah. quotation that you had there, when she was cooking the roast, uh, the roast veal, she says, "Marriage does not make one happier; it takes away the illusion that had sustained a deep belief in a kindred soul, lengthen after a besläktad själ," and sh because she. She's disappointed yes. in poor mm. Otto. He is not a kindred soul. And that is also, it's a little romantic. It reminded me of uh, Nora in a doll's house. Absolutely, yes. She is, mm. you know, uh, she has, she's looking for the, the, the Vidundrliga and, and Torvald. He, she thought she loved him, but mm. she did not because she, he does not treat her as a kindred soul. And as and an equal. Paula and as an equal. As an e to find equal e and a kindred yeah. soul is a, it's, it's a bit more specific. It is, it is. As Alice, nay, not Alice in Wonderland, and Anne of Green Gables will, will, would have it. Kindred souls mm -hmm. are very special. But can you find a kindred soul without thinking he or she is equal to you? No, I cannot. Mm. I cannot. Mm. Uh, and there Rilke comes in <laughs> again. Because I think it's so amazing that Rilke, you write that Rilke wrote a book about the artist's colony of Vorpsvede and he didn't mention Paula with one word. Yes. Mm -hmm. How could he possibly mm -hmm. do mm -hmm. that? But in 1904, uh, in Letters to a Young Poet, he writes that someday there would emerge women whose name will no longer mean the mere opposite of the male, but something in itself, something that makes one think not of any complement and limit, but only of life and reality, a female human being. What shall we say about that? On the, on the one hand, he does not even mention the existing physical women around him. But as a philosopher and a poet, he is very, uh, and, and very um, modern yeah, too. Yeah, and very aware. Of looking of, mm. for the new woman who mm. is a, 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 not just a complement to the man, but a human being in herself. And in the part you read, he adds that this new woman will come from the north of Europe. So, either from here, either from the north of Germany, I don't know. But I suppose he met her 
in Paula and in other women too, in Lou Andrea Salome, in, in other, he met wonderful women and all his act life. Actually, mm. he was friend on friendly terms with Ellen Kay, mm -hmm. the Swedish Absolutely. feminist, Absolutely. who was, I guess, 20 or 30 years older Absolutely. than Rilke. And, and he sometimes said that, that she was an annoying old <laughs> busybody, but he respected her very much. And actually, Paula meets with yes. Rilke and Ellen uh, Kay uh, yes. somewhere in, in your book. Yes, in Paris they have a, b a boring day because they want to be left alone and she's there. <laughs> Again, I, I don't know. I, I, I found all these situations very funny because all these yes high spirits are, are exactly in the same mess than we all are. They want to be left alone and they have to deal with this Swedish very important philosopher and feminist all day Actu at a picnic. Actually, in, 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 actually, in Saint Cloud. Ellen Kay. You can say a lot of things about her. She was great. She was in some respects great. <laughs> in some respects not. But she. She was like a butterfly collector, mm -hmm. and she collected young couple in love. Oh, she really? loved having a lot of young couple in love in her I um, didn't know. collection. Okay, I didn't know. That, that's a new light on this picnic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can tell you afterward. <laughs> so. But... but um, but, uh, yeah, to, to mm. come back to Rilke, he, he knew pa Paula was inventing something important, but the time where he was stuck did not allow him to say it aloud. It's terrible. He can say it in some letters, but never in public. And it, it, in a way, it's a bit coward. Uh, as, it, as if his book about Vorbs Vedder would have been taken less seriously if he mentioned a woman among those great painters, men painters. It's, um, it's a shame. Mm. But uh, this, is, this is truly interesting. A man trying, trying feminism in a way. Yes, in a way. But mm -hmm. he is stuck mm -hmm. in his time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he does not come through. And personally, privately, he was a bit of a, well, prick, I would say. If, if we, we ask Clara, and you, you mentioned that Rilke ran away to Paris and uh, met with Rodin, the famous sculptor, and became his secretary. Mm -hmm. But before that, his beloved Clara, who was a sculptress, had studied for Rodin. So it was she that yes. brought Rodin into the family. And Rilke stole it from her, yes, more or less. Yes, absolutely. And when Paula meets Rodin, she's introduced to the great master as not Paula Modersenbecker, just the wife of a very well-known German painter, Otto Modersen. Her name is not even mentioned on the letter that is addressed by Rilke to Rodin. So it's a... Uh, when I read that, I thought, really, we, we are better now. <laughs> we can complain, but we are so much away from that. We can exist as women, and men can be so much more free with us and happy, I'm sure, because the couples I read about in this, all these letters are... It's very complex to be happy in the time as a couple, I think. Mm. Um, I th Otto Morderson, after all, at, at the beginning of their marriage, he is very supportive. Mm -hmm. He's, he supports his w wife's ambitions. He says she's certainly the best woman painter in Worpswede. And then he says she's yes. one of the best. There are three women in <laughs> Worpswede. <laughs> but but, but he, he says also that uh, uh, he, he will... Um, uh, it's... Uh, she, her time will come. Mm -hmm. I will, I'm sure she will give us a big s surprise in the future. And, and, and he sometimes he sees her genius and sometimes he complains that her, her things are ugly, bizarre, wooden, mm -hmm. mouths mm -hmm. mouth like wounds and faces like cretans. He sounds more or less like... Yes. 
the Nazis uh, hands like spoons depicting and the noses gener- like a degenerated art. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but he, and he says she must learn to paint beautifully. Yes, he 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 wants pretty things. What is expected of a, a young woman? Pretty paintings, and she can do it. And uh, they, they are so pretty paintings. She can, but then they are so harsh when she gets more mature. And he's very disappointed. But I thought that mm. he's maybe he also meant that it would be good for her to practice her technique. She practiced her technique a lot. Uh, she, she was okay with her technique. Uh, no, he wanted her to be what is supposed to be traditionally a woman. But as soon as she goes to Paris and she learns so much from the Parisian art and, and the schools, basically, she has another problem. She doesn't, she doesn't want to ask him too much money. And models are expensive. So she, first she pays young Italian women. The, the first migrants of those times in Paris were Italian people. They were very poor and the women accepted to be naked and, and pose for Pola and she paid them. And then even that was too expensive, so she started painting herself naked. And she was, and I'm sure she didn't know it, the very first woman to paint herself naked. Autoportraits. And even pregnant. What did did Otto say about that? He he was very, very shocked and surprised. And, 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 And he thought it was... For him, the faces, her faces, was ugly when, when, when she painted herself. She was so much more beautiful, according to him, than what she painted of herself. She, of course, so paints in a stylized way. Mm. Uh, if, if her portrait of Rilke looks, looked like an African mask, her self-portraits, they are stylized. It's not a photographic likeness. Mm. But they, as le- at least to me, they signal uh, great calmness and uh, yes. archetypical. She's very calm. But she, she's a bit. Um, she smiles always a little bit on her on her self portrait, like if she knew it was not okay, you know, to paint herself naked. But also, what is surprising is that. Um, when she paints herself naked or other women or girls naked, including little girls, she paints in a way that is completely new. It's subtle, it's subtle, it's, it's, but you can see it. It's not erotic. It can be very voluptuous, vol- very sensual, but it's not erotic because it's not seen by the usual heterosexual male gaze. When she starts painting in the Louvre, there are only four women who are exhibited as painters. Uh, Vigier Lebrun, Charlotte, uh, well, four, and they are not very well known. From the 18th century. And there are thousands of women naked on the paintings. Uh, 99.9% of the painters that are exhibited in the Louvre are men. So Paula is alone, and she sees all those naked women, and she paints something else. Because she doesn't see women the way men see women. She, she's very heterosexual. She loves men. She, there, there are some novels who put her uh, with a lesbian ambiguity with Clara. It's interesting. It's possible. But I know she really was attracted physically to some men in her life. So she looked at women with a woman's eye. And it's new. It's just new. A- and you can see it because it's... Um, it's another sensuality. That, that is very interesting. And you said that you, you feel she reveals a little smile, a little archaic smile in this calm, quite light setting. But when you visited the famous Wolfgang Museum in Essen, mm. and you do this remark that in the museum, there were all these world-famous men, male painters, uh, Gauguin, Klee, you name them. But the basement, the cellar, <laughs> was full of women from the it's, antique times. It's a times terrible story. To this t- it's a very good museum, and they were not lucky, because the day I visited them, they had a, a feminine show. 
which is already a bad idea, I think. But anyway, that's a complex debate. But they showed feminine paintings, well, painting painted by women in the basement with a terrible light. And the masterpiece of Paula that they have, that I wanted to see, was shown really in the, in the darkness, in, the, in a corner, behind a TV showing a modern video. And the, the, the curator was so embarrassed. He was a man, a really nice man, and he knew it was a terrible situation, and he didn't want to show it to me. And he was not responsible of that show, and it was terribly awkward. But they, they had <laughs> they had a self-portrait by Paula, uh, one self, of her best self-portrait mm -hmm. with Camellia, mm -hmm. uh, and you saw this little smile. But the male curata curators immediately start talking about her sorrowful eyes yes. mm -hmm. and that she she seemed disappointed and and i mm -hmm. think that was a very interesting it's remark mm -hmm. yeah i was with two uh, with the curator and a friend um, a man friend from essen germany and both guys agreed that the face was very sad and that there were even tears in her eyes and all i could see was a very focused woman painting herself with focused eyes and a little ironic smile. It's very strange that uh, you have to look on the internet when you come back. A self-portrait with Camellia. And, and, and you, 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 you make your own opinion. Uh, I think that the quotations from her letters that you gave us uh, also reveals a woman artist fundamentally secure of her herself, I'm not sure, but of her art. Mm. Fundamentally secure of her art. And she agrees that a painter, she, she agrees with a friend, that a painter needs strength. But she immediately thinks of its opposite. Not weakness, but rather softness. Mm -hmm. uh, that she can feel the soft, vibrant threads of a cobweb, flappering wings that hold their breath. When I really know how to paint, I paint this, mm -hmm. cobwebs, softness, and flattering wings, flappering wings. And I think that's a fantastic image. Yes. She knew uh, exactly, in these days. She knew exactly what she wanted, and it's very un-German in a way. What will come after she dies, the Nazis will be there about 25 years after her death, and they are not cobweb style. They are exactly what you don't like in men, virility. Virility? Uh, that, and she was... Of course, you may think that it's feminine to be soft and cobweb style, but that's a man can be like that too. But at that time in Germany, you, you had to paint the peasants, the tradition, the, the strengths, and the 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 ever eternity of the landscape, you know. Uh, but no, she couldn't care less about that Germany. She painted the fragility of the people, uh, of of and especially of the little girls, but also their their nobility. And uh, at that time, the other German painters didn't do that. Uh, you started with the fact that... All, hello. Hello. <laughs> almost, almost no one in France was familiar with Paula Moders on Becker. Uh, I think in, in Germany, she is well known yes. because her diary and her letters has been published several times. And I, I don't know whether you agree with me, but to me personally, she was not a new acquaintance. I'm, I was familiar with her paintings, I think, from the late 70s. And I think through the women's movement. Mm -hmm. I am sure I have seen postcards with the self-portrait with the, the, of the pregnant woman. And that uh, some of her self-portraits are somewhat iconic within the, the sweet German and, and, and Scandinavian That's women's good. movement. Mm -hmm. 
But how, but after all, she's German, she studied in France, she lived in Paris, mm -hmm. she wrote about Paris. Why do you think she was completely unknown in France? Mm -hmm. Two problems. German woman. German, well, it, during years it was very hard to welcome a, a, a German culture after the World War II. Uh, the, the wounds in Paris were very, very deep. Second, woman. France is not a very feminist country in the way you can be, or America or Canada can be. We are becoming more and more, and in our way, and it's very interesting time at the moment to be a woman in France. Very, very interesting. But there was a big obstacle. Uh, there was a big... The frontier was not... I, and I tried to, to convince other museums, big museums in Paris, the Musée d'Orsay, the Grand Palais, the, the, and the Musée d'Art Moderne uh, welcomed me. It's another great museum. But I had to talk a lot and uh, to convince them. And, uh, but the, uh, it's a long story with those museums, but they were really great at this museum. So I, I did the show with them, the exhibition. I, it was, I put myself in such a mess for her, because it's not my job to be a curator. I don't know how to do an, an exhibition. So of course they, they, they helped me a lot, but I, I put so much energy in that woman and her heart. And I even rented a camping car. How do you call that? Um, a mobile home, a mobile car, with my family, my three children and my husband. We went in August in Germany, can you imagine? From painting to painting, Essen, Dusseldorf, Bremen, Hamburg. My kids were so fed up <laughs> because I wanted to see all the paintings. <laughs> no, it was really funny. But th so I, I put so much energy in her. And, and really now, She's, she's known in France, and the book was a, a big success, etc. The story, they, the people loved her story, but it was a lot of uh, yes, a lot of energy. <laughs> um, the, uh, questions? Yes, please. please. Uh, uh, the, uh, the tight. Uh, oh, the the title. title, yes, lovely to live here, and uh, that is a quotation from guess who, <laughs> Rainer Maria Rilke, yeah. and and uh, what does um, uh, the question was what does hair here means is it here in this world or is it in Worpswede or it's from uh, Rilke's uh, elegy, Duino elegy. I don't know how you could translate that, and it's it's so. It means both in the world, now, here, in my body. It, he's a poet, so he puts a lot of things in the world. And the, those elegies are very beautiful. Mm. We shall. Yes. We sh I will not forget that. <laughs> but do we have any other questions before that? We, ca we can take two. Ah, yes. Another Did she mm -hmm. sell any uh -huh. painter, paintings? She sold three uh, to friends, always, uh, and one to Rilke. And what is very interesting is the painting that he chose, and then I, and I, I had the painting brought to Paris. This bad father chose the painting of a little baby. I think it's very strange and very touching. And also, it was a very small painting, so it, he could carry it everywhere in his uh, many travels. And, um, and, the, well, and Rilke did that, bought the painting, to give her money. He was a good friend, and he paid it uh, 100 marks, which was a lot of money. So, three paintings only in our life. Now you cannot even think of buying a painting of her. <laughs> and the Requiem, shall I answer? Or? I just see. Any, any more questions? From Germany, ah. and uh, I know it works. I know that she's uh, um, got inspiration from the great French painters. Mm -hmm. But for me, I can't explain how. But for me, she's typical German. I, I agree too. Yeah. I was a bit too radical. I think yes, she's very German too. 
you will t in her subjects in the fact that she paints the landscape, the peasants, um, and what she loves in Germany. And also there is something a bit harsh, a bit... Uh, but she does not paint them to... Um, to make them great, you know, to make them... Uh, uh, pour les glorifier, to glorify them. Uh, do you agree? How do you find her German? I can't explain why, <laughs> why but for me, she is, in, in a way, she is, uh, she is, for me, is a picture of Germany, this woman. And, and um, my, my, my thought is, perhaps that's why she didn't become um, famous in, in France. Yes, in France. It's, yes it's, yeah, it's possible. And again, we didn't welcome uh, German things for a and long time. And what makes her, makes her German is not the, the subjects, it's the, the language, the pictorial language, I think. She is also very French in her pictorial language because of her, the influence, as I said. Of, but, but she's a good mixture, I suppose, yes. <laughs> Did you find out if she had <laughs> lovers? <laughs> yes, yes, she did. At, uh, probably two. Uh, a, a famous sociologist called Werner Sombart, a German. And a, a Werner Sombart. Uh, there is a famous. painting of a, a She did a portrait of him. She met him uh, in, in, in the mountains in uh, Austria. In, um, well, all those frontiers have moved, but it, in actual Czechia. Uh, on a, a weekend trip with her husband. And a mysterious Bulgarian uh, artist in Paris. It's all very discreet because, of course, she doesn't speak about it in her letters. And in the diary, you can guess. Some other biographies, I know the, the, the thick ones, but they are interesting also. <laughs> uh, some of them um, are very sure about that. I'm, I cannot be sure. I suppose, and in a way, I hope so, yes. But I, yeah. <laughs> I have one question. Uh, now you have told us very interesting about your biography. And now you have done all this research, you've written your biography. If you now should written a novel, a short mm -hmm. novel about Paula, what would you add or what would you take off? I would make her live. I would make her live. I would add 60 years to her life. I would uh, have her watch her daughter grow. I would invent her, her work, cubism. I, I would have her as an old lady. I would love that. I, it, it's, it's very strange because it makes me sad that she's dead. It's a very strange feeling for uh, somebody I, I don't know, I never met. But I, yes, I would like to add life to her, yes. Mm. Perhaps I will, I don't know. <laughs> shall, we, shall we give the last word to Rilke then in his uh, Requiem for a friend? It's, it's so... It's, it's fantastically said about a painter, painting. And at last you saw yourself as a fruit. You stepped out of your clothes and brought your naked body before the mirror. You let yourself inside down to your gaze, which stayed in front, immense, and didn't say, I am that. No, this is. It's very strange, this Requiem, because I read it when I was young, many times. It's very short. It's in three parts for three dead friends. And in the middle, there is the part for the girlfriend. And I suddenly realized that was her. And she... She's not named. He doesn't name her. Why? Women have no name. There's something like that. But of course that's her. And, uh, and Oscar, we know it because in a letter, he says that one year exactly after her death, he's so unhappy, so sad, that he locks himself in a hotel room in Paris for three days and he writes about her. And, and that's all we know. But um, he was um, destroyed by his death for a long time. Mm. 
her death. Thank you very much, yes. Marie. Thank you. And uh, I envy you all who have this, her, this book uh, not yet read. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Merci. you very much.